India, France, Japan, Canada. Does the way a baby gets his bath affect his character when he grows up, making him too timid, say, or too aggressive? Can you take that a step further? Is the way a nation treats its children reflected in the national character of that nation, making it too timid or too aggressive? Or is it fair even to talk about national character? We're going on a visit to four families in four countries, India, France, Japan, and Canada, and we're going to explore questions like these in films shot especially for the Comparisons program. Our guide for the tour is Dr. Margaret Mead of the American Museum of Natural History, comparative anthropologist, and of course, writer. Dr. Mead, you've done a good deal of this sort of thing. Why? What can you find out by comparing children? Well, you see, human babies are born uh, with the ability to, be, to grow up as members of any society be an Eskimo, or a Russian, or a Hottentot, or a Japanese, or a Frenchman, or a Canadian. At birth, they're equally able to be any kind of person, and it depends upon the way they're trained and taught, loved and punished, uh, whether they turn into one kind of person or another. So if we make a study of this, and find out the steps by which these human babies become one kind of grown-up person instead of another, we learn a great deal about it. But still, the details of a bath, or the way the baby's fed, the way it's punished or rewarded, give us a great many clues about the way character is formed in that society. But you have to be careful, of course, that you compare the same kind of people. You can't have a peasant family in one society and a city family in another. You have to be sure that they're the same kinds of families before you can make any kind of real comparison. Well, we've tried our best to get similar families in these films. They're all, for instance, farm families uh, living either in small villages or on isolated farms. The babies in each case are about a year old, a month here, a month there. The incomes of the families are about average for the areas they live in, although there's a wide difference between countries. Now, the first family we're going to see is in India, and we're going there now to see the Indian family. This is the main street to the village of Fursangi in the fertile plateau of Pune, not far from Bombay. Fursangi is a fairly big village, 5,000 people, but it has no factories. It's chiefly a marketing center where the farmers of the district come to buy and to sell. December is a pleasant month, the hot season is over, and the monsoons have passed, leaving the streams and irrigation canals brimming with water. Thanks to the rain, the year's first crop has been good, and farmers like Vishnu Shivali are plowing their land for the second crop. His six-acre farm was heavily mortgaged when Vishnu got it from his father. He worked in a factory in another town to pay off the mortgage. Now he owns it outright, the bullocks he drives, and the new iron plow. His cash income is $600 a year, most of it from the sale of onions. Shivali's wife, Rukmini, comes to this well every morning with the other village women to scrub the big brass pots with sand, to gossip a little, and of course to get the household water. The village of Fursangi has two wells like these, built with government loans. This water is used only for cooking, drinking, and bathing. When Urukmini has a washing to do, she takes the clothes to a brook which is half a mile from the house. 
The well is also half a mile from the house. A fair walk with a 40 pound load. Ruth Minnie spends the morning doing her housework and getting water. In the afternoon, she takes a lunch and the children and goes to help her husband in the fields. Their house on the main street is made of stone and clay with three quite big rooms and a veranda. The stable is behind it. Those pots are handsome, Dr. Mead. They hold water. And water in India is tremendously valuable. It has to be brought such a long way, either to the household or to the fields. And it's important religiously, too, because every Hindu has to bathe every day and can only enter the temple in clean clothes. Fuel is valuable and scarce in India, too. There's not enough wood for cooking. And this woman is cooking with dried cow dung. That's Dilip, the eldest boy, and his sister, Rajana. Now the mother's preparing the baby for his daily bath, rubbing coconut oil into his hair. The water for the baby's bath has been heated, even though this is a warm climate. And the mother tests the water carefully to see that it's the right temperature. Now notice the way she holds the baby, rather as if he were made of rubber. She doesn't expect him to respond to her, but holds him very firmly while she rubs her hands over his rather oddly resistant body. Do you see? She treats him almost as if he didn't have any bones. <laughs> The baby wears black beads around his wrists and black thread around his waist to protect him against evil. And the mother's gesture as she sprinkles water around his head at the end of the bath is also a magical protection. <laughs> The baby's clothes are not made at home, but are made by the local village tailor. This baby wears no diapers. In the early months, it is allowed to urinate or defecate anywhere on the earthen floor. And when it gets a little older, it's taken out from time to time and held out until it is trained. The mother puts soot from the sesame oil lamp mixed with butter under the baby's eyes. This is supposed to strengthen them. <laughs> But this powder and a small black mark on its forehead are for beauty. But these black marks of soot are again for protection against evil. Who 
Food isn't forced on Indian babies, but they are fed whenever they appear to want it. Mothers don't have a great deal of time to play with their children in this part of India. Although children are often teased. <laughs> this rattle is baby Shirish's only toy. Rajana, the little sister, whines a good deal while all the attention is being given to the baby. Her brother tries to comfort her, but she slaps his hand away. This is one of the few toys that they have. Indian children depend very little on toys. It's evening and Rukmini lights the lamp. This lamp, though, is in the household shrine. And it burns sesame oil, the soot from which is mixed with butter and put under the baby's eyes. How the mother is going to prepare the evening meal. She's making pancakes from buckwheat flour. Making a perfect pancake that won't burn has the same hazards the world over. She breaks the finished pancake in half and in quarters and arranges it on a brass plate with two vegetables that have been cooked in chili. And the whole family are seated on the floor and the father begins the meal with brief religious ceremony. As the mother sprinkled water around the baby at the end of its bath, so the father sprinkles water at the beginning of the meal and makes a brief prayer gesture. <laughs> Then the meal goes on with the father and older children eating together and setting the tone of the meal while the mother sits aside feeding the baby milk. She herself will eat alone later. In the evening in the village, the men gather for a talk and a smoke. Women take no part in these occasions. Vishnu has now joined his friends. That's an elaborate crib that baby has. Especially when you realize that the father and mother and the older children sleep on mats on the floor. But it's not unusual to find the a crib or the baby carriage or something to carry the baby in being especially elaborate among poor people in many parts of the world. Dr. Mead, what would you say were the chief attitudes towards children in that family? I think we saw them best in the bath, where the mother was warm, took great care of the baby, but somehow didn't seem to expect the baby to respond to her movement so much. She did things to it and for it and it remained rather passive through it all. Uh, you'll find warmth, care for the children, perhaps more emphasis on physical care than on anything else. And then, of course, we have to realize that 
it's a great economic burden to bring up children in this part of the world. And even though people are proud of having them, children are a burden. Our next family is French. They seem to have the same attachment for old things, heirlooms you might call them, such as the cradle and the water pots in India. We go now to France. At noon on every school day, the elder Houdouin children, Jean-Claude and Claudette, pass the 14th century church in the small town of Sermez, which is about 40 miles south of Paris. With loaves of bread, bought at the baker's, they're on their way home for noon dinner. The old lanes of Sermez don't change much. The town hasn't grown at all in recent years. It's half a mile through hilly pastures, deserted in January, to the tiny village, 90 people, of La Belle Etoile, to the stone farmhouse, which for as long as records go back has been in the Houdouin family. On the 75-acre farm, Monsieur Houdouin keeps a couple of cows, horses for working and for drawing the family carriage. He grows vegetables and grain. Wheat is his main cash crop, and his income is about $1,000 a year. This is Madame Houdouin. And on the floor, in the background there, are Bernard, Four, and Frédéric, the baby. It's winter in this French kitchen, and all the family are bundled up in drab, mended clothes that show how workaday this life is. And the children are playing with simple homemade objects, a spool, a cartridge, a block of wood with a string attached. Ah, ben c'est à ce que vous rentrez tous les deux. Et la fourchette, qui c'est qui va la traire? The children don't get any affectionate greeting, but instead the boy is sent off immediately to get milk and the little girl is told to get on with setting the table. Children this age have their appointed tasks in the routine of the home. The mother and baby engage in a sensuous interplay emphasizing food and the mouth as the mother sucks the baby's finger with delight and communicates delight in the food to the baby. She even offers a little food to the older child as a way of playing on the younger child's jealousy and so persuading the younger child to eat more of the milk and mashed potato. The father greets the little boy warmly, but pays no attention to the two older children who take their places a little primly at the table. Talk and smiles and food and delight in the mouth are blended together as the baby is allowed to feed its father and its older brother. Here the family gather around the table and the baby's high chair puts it on a level with its parents just as the baby was on the same level when the Indian family sat on the floor. The father makes the sign of the cross on the loaf of bread, reminiscent of the sacredness of bread among peasants all over Europe. And he cuts off large 
rich hunks for each child. The little boy is sent off to get a jug of cider. Would that be hard cider, Dr. Mead? Oh, I think so, because either wine or cider would be shared with the baby. He's learning to appreciate and enjoy food. And here's the end of the meal, a whole brie cheese. A very small segment of this would be prohibitively expensive in another country. Now time to start clearing the table. This is a familiar routine. Each child knows exactly what he or she is supposed to do. They set off for school, they receive another admonition, not to be late. C'est bien, papa, mon petit garçon. Tu viens? Allons, viens, viens. Allez, allez, hop. Father and baby together enjoy their mouths. Venir à sa chichette à présent, comme un grand garçon. Hop là, là, poché. But after the pleasure is over, you notice that even the baby is given an admonition to be a wise, good child. Oh, tu seras bien sage, mon mignon, hein? Tu prends pas à l'âge de ta maman, hein? Au revoir, mon petit mignon. Tu dis au revoir, papa. When his diaper is changed, he gets a bit of a sponge bath. There's none of the elaborate protection against evil or 
cosmetic decoration that accompanied the Indian baby's body. But unlike the Indian baby, this baby does not get a tub bath every day, but only once every four or five days. And the mother controls him by her hands on each side of him and by speaking to him instead of holding him firmly in place as the Indian mother did. She picks him up in a way that shows him that she was frightened and communicates her fright like a threat. So she had to lull him again before she could put him down in his carriage to go to sleep. And he goes to sleep in this large, expensive baby carriage, as conspicuous and elaborate in this poor kitchen as the Indian baby's cradle was when compared with the rest of the Indian house. Fais dodo, cola mon petit frère. Fais dodo, t'auras du lolo. Papa est en haut, qui fait des gâteaux. Maman est en bas, qui fait du cola. Fais dodo, cola mon petit frère, fais dodo, t'auras du lolo. Do the Houdoirs seem to be typically French in their attitude toward children? I think they're very typical. This combination of the emphasis on food, on the delights of eating and drinking and later talking uh, that goes on here combined with the discipline and the requirement that children learn the pattern of living and learn to carry it out obediently and precisely and well. This is very typical of the way in which the French bring up their children in rural regions like this. At what age is a child expected to accept this discipline? Well, they started very early, as we saw here with this little four-year-old that was supposed to carry his own dishes out to where they were going to be washed. But at the same time, a child is about eight or nine before it's expected to understand and be reasonable and take responsibility for its own acts. There was, to me, an obvious strength to this family. Uh, where do you think it comes from? I think from the warmth and intensity of the relationships between the parents and the children. In our next family, I think there's a very warm, strong relationship, too, though in a different way, and it seems to involve a great many more people. We're going now to Japan to meet our Japanese family. <laughs> 